brother friend and pastor nikki he he needs no introduction he is a part of our family amen and uh, i'm looking forward to listening to the word of god with great insights hallelujah amen let's all welcome brother nikki thank you shalom alaikum i have greeted you exactly the way that the lord jesus would have greeted all of his disciples peace be with you amen <laughs> uh, i want to start with one verse from the gospel of luke chapter 12 and verse 1 it's and a lot will come on your screen uh, today on on this because uh, i'm going to be breaking this part the message into a into a very long introduction and then coming to what we're trying to look at okay because uh, my attempt is to try to make uh whatever we're looking at from a new testament perspective alive in today's context applicable to us and at the same time us recognizing the diversity and the complex situation that existed at the time of the at the time of the new testament or what is called today as the second temple judaism uh the time during which the lord yeshua operated so we're going to look at that but we're going to look at it from a historical cultural perspective factual perspective and then try to apply what we're looking at in our lives today all right so we start with luke chapter 12 and verse 1 where it says he began to say to his disciples first of all beware of the leaven of the pharisees which is hypocrisy okay now i'm going to ask you a question uh right do we know who the pharisees were and i want this to be as interactive as possible when you hear the word pharisee what's the first thing that comes to your mind they're jews okay who want to yeah so you think of okay the wrath of the messiah towards them okay then any any other suggestions Okay yeah we'll look at that thank you anyone else religious people self righteous people yeah good good answers okay we'll see some of the call outs that i put over there because as i've asked other friends and other pastors as well i've got good inputs from people okay so bad people someone would say some would say that they were frauds okay evil people someone else said uh, proud men yeah knowledgeable but dishonest people and teachers who did wrong hypocrites right all right good good inputs so uh, what i want us to look at today is going to be of course we'll keep all this in mind but i want us to look at it with a very open heart okay because none of what we are saying is wrong at the same time there is also the other side of it so we're going to look at it from a very open heart this morning and at the same time look at the complex situation that existed when yeshua the messiah came so of course if you look at the expressions on the faces that are depicted in any movie you look at the chosen or you look at the jesus film or you look at any other movies about the lord and about the gospels you'll always find the pharisees depicted as these very angry kind of serious guys who had such long faces that somebody said this once that you know the pharisees and the sadducees they were sad because sad you see they had faces that were hanging from here right down to the floor that's the kind of image that has been built up about them okay but what i want to show you this morning and we'll move on to the next one is that there were different groups at the time when the lord was ministering on the earth different groups there were not only pharisees there were not only sadducees but as i'm going to show you there are many more groups as well and the way that we can understand it is in today's christian uh, environment there are not only anglicans there are not only methodists there are not only pentecostals there are not only charismatics there are not only nazarenes there are not only brethrens there are not only baptists there are not only presbyterians but there are so many denominations somebody has said that there are more than 44000 protestant denominations 44000 protestant denominations okay so 
I think we operate in a more complex environment than even the Lord did. Maybe that's why he said, right? You'll do greater things than me. <laughs> it's a, just a, a joke. Okay, but I want this to be a little light-hearted because if we're studying, we shouldn't get too serious. We should be able to focus and understand. Okay, so we're going to look at all of these groups today. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, the Essenes, the Samaritans, the Galileans, and others. Okay, these are the large categories of groups that you see even in the New Testament. Okay, so we'll start with the Pharisees. Now, what I want to say is as a background, now I work for an Israeli company. And I remember a few years back when we had a project going on, we were moving from Oracle to SAP, very big project, okay, in our company. And we had two of the two big consultants who came down from our head office in Israel. And one morning I, I come to office and my team comes and tells me, you know, both of them had a big fight today. I said, oh my goodness, what happened? So they, they said they were talking in Hebrew and, and this person says it to me in Hindi. He says, Usne dusre ko bola marne ke liye. He told him to die. So I said, just tell me what exactly he said. He said, I, I, I don't know, he spoke in Hebrew, but he used the word die. His, the other guy's name was Shlomo. He said, Shlomo, die! So I started laughing. I told him, buddy, Die doesn't mean marna. They're talking in Hebrew. When you say die in Hebrew, you're saying enough. No more argument. Stop it. <laughs> you know, so I'm trying to say there's a perspective. On one perspective, I'm thinking, hey, you, you said to die. You told him to, to marne ke liye. But here he's saying enough. It's like the word, the name, shaddai. The one who is enough. Die, enough, Shah, the one is, who is, that's why we say almighty, or the one who is enough, the one who is self-sufficient, right? So, uh, this brought to light the manner in which Jewish people work, the way Hebrew culture is and the culture of the Bible. And I can tell you, I've witnessed this, sometimes when we're on calls, the manner in which conversations are going on, you're wondering what's going on. They're in a room, banging their fists, shouting at each other. And then at the end, hey, come on, let's have a cup of coffee together. You think, how can you have a cup of coffee when you've shouted at each other, insulted each other? And what I came to learn over a period of time is that the Hebrew mindset is a mindset that encourages dialogue, encourages discussion, encourages even argument. And if you don't argue, you're not adding value into a conversation. You're just sitting there like a dummy. <laughs> you know? So, um, and then I started to also look back at some of the historical documents. And there is a document, there is a, a, a very volume, a big volume called the Talmud in, the, in Jewish literature, which is basically an explanation, or you can say Bible studies, on various scriptures. And in the Talmud, you will see one rabbi said this, the other rabbi said that, and then they both had an argument with each other, and finally they arrived at some conclusion. So the mindset is that unless you argue, unless you talk, unless you discuss, you're never going to reach the right conclusion. The only framework is that you do it in a respectful manner. You recognize that there are, I have elderly people, you recognize I have people who are probably superior in terms of education, in terms of knowledge, in terms of experience. You don't insult them, but in a respectful manner, you talk, you dialogue, you discuss, and then you arrive at the best conclusion, because unless you do that, you can't reach the best conclusion. Otherwise, we become kind of like an autocratic society, which is very Western in thinking. It's like, you know, we've, we've come up as Indians, we've come up a lot under the British system, which is very hierarchical in nature. You address your, your, your next in command as sir, madam, most of us, okay? That's how it is. Whereas in Hebrew society, that's not the way they think. They think, okay, you have superiors, but you can still add value by talking to them. You can still add value by arguing, by discussing, by bringing your thoughts to the table, because that's why you're here. And that is the environment in which the New Testament is written. So when we look at it from the way we are educated as, in terms of the British way of education, we think, oh my goodness, Jesus is shouting at the Pharisees, he really disliked them. When you look at it from a Hebrew culture perspective, it's all happening within one family. 
as sister said they were jews so you know you look at the environment in which some of these conversations happen they're sitting and and talking they eating food together on in one occasion they're sitting and eating food together and they talk about washing of hands right they were disagreeing on the way wash hand washing should happen so to which the lord replied hey you know what goes in doesn't make you unclean but what comes out makes you unclean the context was not about eating pork or eating shellfish the context was if you eat with dirty hands do you become unclean that was the context of the whole conversation we need to understand that because if you if we misunderstand it then we put an entirely different meaning to the text that was actually over there and meant it to be there by the writer of the gospel all right so now let's look at the pharisees first of all the pharisees were divided into two schools one is called the school of hillel and the other was called the school of shammai these were the two prominent rabbis if you would say it in today's world you would say i have gone to a pentecostal bible college and the other says i have gone to a baptist bible college all right it was two different schools of thoughts but were they are the pentecostals and the baptists like not christians both christians have different points of view have different ways to address the same text in the bible i'm telling you the way the baptists or the brethren would look at acts chapter 2 and the speaking of tongues will be absolutely different from the way pentecostals look at it right pastor ezra absolutely different the same text but they looking at it in two different ways and in the same way the school of hillel and the school of shammai would look at the same text from the old testament scriptures and interpret it in two totally different ways paul came from the school of hillel and paul himself said i I'm a Pharisee. If you look in Acts chapter 23, he says, "I am a Pharisee." So he was from the school of Hillel. Okay, so now let's look at what the Pharisees believed. Now they were a people who were not comfortable with the Roman rule, and you know, at that time, the Romans were ruling over the land of Israel. The Pharisees were not very comfortable about it, but they were not rich and affluent people in society, so they could really do nothing much about it. So they just had to accept. the situation in which they operated now school of hillel and shammai as i said have different views even on the uh, shabbat put all of all of it okay even on how do you um, how do you operate on shabbat so for, let me give you an example you see in one place where yeshua is talking to the people and he says hey listen if your donkey falls into a pit on the shabbat what are you going to do about it have you read that scripture Yeah. Now, do we know why? I'll tell you why it happened. It's because both schools of thought were very different. So, one school of thought, the school of Shammai, said, "On Shabbat, you do nothing. You wait till Sunday morning, because we you know Sunday is the first day of the week, not the not the Sabbath. Okay. So, you wait till Sunday morning, and then you take the donkey out of the pit." The school of Hillel said, "No, life is more important than anything else." If it's a question of life and death then you do what needs to be done even on the shabbat. So now in that environment when the lord is speaking to the people over there he's not encouraging them or saying that listen the shabbat doesn't matter anymore. He's trying to tell them that look you have two schools of thought but listen this is the one that I agree with and this is the right way of thinking. Life is more important. Eating of food is more important then to say listen uh, i i shouldn't pluck grains from the field one school of thought said no you shouldn't you're breaking the sabbath laws and he was saying listen even david did it even david ate the shoe bread from from the temple which was only permitted for the priests why because there are laws in place but like you know if you work in an organization there are always exceptions there's always the exception to the law and the exception is life is more important so yeshua was teaching them listen how do you how do you implement the law how do you implement the system and i i'm telling you if we don't uh, get some of this then we tend to think that uh, the lord was totally doing away with an old system and bringing a new system but what he was trying to do is within the framework of, way, of which they operated trying to tell them that this is the right way of doing what the lord always showed from the very beginning now the pharisees were people who believed in the resurrection and they got that from daniel chapter 12 they also get that from the passage in which the lord the father meets moses moshe at the burning bush 
and when he tells him that listen i am the god of abraham isaac and jacob and jesus used that same passage to say listen in god's sight even at the type of time of moses abraham isaac and jacob were alive why because of the resurrection daniel chapter 12 says right that the time will come towards the end when all who sleep in the dust will be raised up some to life and some to eternal condemnation so the pharisees held to that tradition and that set of beliefs that the resurrection is going to happen one day okay now um the pharisees and the sadducees also differed in terms of their understanding of how gentiles that means non jews or non israelis would come into the kingdom of god the the sadducees seem to think that god's plan was only for the house of israel and not for the other nations so they viewed god as the god of israel and they said there are other gods you know okay there is one god for us but there are others and they have their life we have our life the pharisee said no there is one god and he is the god of all flesh and we have to do our job to take out his word into to them into their lives and to feed them the word of god and to bring them into god's family that was the pharisee thought so the the sadducee said that the gentiles have no position or no place in the kingdom of god in the in eternity but the pharisee said they do have a place but they have to come in we need to bring them in into our home into our family according to our systems okay so number one that's the way the pharisees thought all right now an important thing also that we need to note over here is that the pharisees believed not only in the written law which is called the torah or the first five books of moses what we call the pentateuch and they also believed in the oral law and the oral traditions now what is that the oral law oral traditions were what they believed was passed on orally from god to moses moses to joshua joshua to all of the other leaders and thereafter generation to generation the sadducees said we will only go by what is written in the word of god so now if you have to make a choice It's a difficult choice because on some things you say I agree with the Pharisees, on some things you say I agree with the Sadducees. You see, that's that's part of the complexity. Okay, now the the waters are going to get a lot more muddy. Okay, as we start to look at the other groups. So um, I hope you're not getting bored. First of all, with all the details. <laughs> all right, let's move on. Let's look at the at the Sadducees now. So the Sadducees were the rich. affluent people of society at that time okay and along with the pharisees they cons- they constituted what was called the sanhedrin which was the group of 70 elders who managed the temple who managed jewish law who managed relationships with the roman empire and who decided what was right for society so they were like the government but the government of course was the romans but below them for jewish life the sadducees and the pharisees constituted what was the leadership of the nation okay now they were people who did not believe the oral instructions but said only the written word of god and nothing else as i said they didn't believe in the resurrection they didn't believe in angels they didn't believe in spirits they just believed that what you have in front of you physical life that's it nothing else now they had excellent relationships with the roman empire and because they were rich because they were affluent they continued to allow the romans to operate without any kind of rebellion without any kind of problems because any time the jewish people would say we don't want these guys the sadducees would come and suppress that sort of a rebellion and said no 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 listen it's okay we'll continue to be under the roman rule they were the people who allowed hellenism to enter now hellenism the word hellenism means greek greek culture 
so when you see that um, uh, there is an influence of greek culture entering into jewish society the people who contributed to it were the sadducees because they said it's okay let's diversify let's become a lot like the world now if you start to compare it today you'll have a group of christians who will say listen we need to go only by the system of the bible only by the system of what the word of god says and then you'll have certain people who say listen let's allow the things of the world the modern movements within the world to come in because we need to learn from the world we need to become better the church needs to become better by looking at what the world says now which one do you agree with it's a difficult choice right because yeah you'd say okay i agree with with this let's modernize and yet modernize at the cost of what so again that was a part of the complex environment in which they operated acts chapter 23 and verse 8 says that the sadducees said that there was no resurrection there were no angels no spirits but the pharisees confessed them both okay uh, they would often have discussions about the afterlife so if you recall the discussion that yeshua had with one person who asked him a question he said look a man had a wife and he died and then the wife married the brother and the brother died and there were no children and then the next and then you know how many were there seven, seven brothers so whose wife will she be finally in the kingdom okay now who's asking this the sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection so you know they're trying to trap him over there and what does he say <laughs> you be like the angels they don't get married the angels don't get married you know i use that as as context to talk about genesis 6 which talks about fallen angels which people say fallen angels they married women but the lord tells us that the angels don't marry okay that's a different topic but i'm trying to say understand the context why did that conversation happen the context was the resurrection a group of people who never believed in the resurrection were asking this question in order to trap him but this is the background this is the environment in which it uh, the whole thing operated okay so we'll move on now to the next group of people which are called the essenes we looked at the pharisees we've looked at the sadducees now before we move ahead can i ask you if anyone has heard of the essenes yeah good all right now the essenes were people who were sick and tired of all of these arguments you stupid pharisees you silly sadducees i'm tired of this i'm going away you must have heard of that right i'm tired of this church i'm going away i'm starting my own church <laughs> so the essenes were kind of like that tired of mainstream judaism is it enough this is sickening i'm going away we're just going to study the word of god and we're going to build up our own lives away from all of these arguments and of course they would keep arguing with the pharisees and with the sadducees so these were a people that moved out of the mainstream part of jerusalem and hebron and surrounding areas and moved southwards towards the desert okay and uh, in fact if you if you look at today's map you, there's an area called qumran k q u m q u m r a n qumran okay and this is where they basically lived and they established a community of their home there's a lot of archaeology that has been done that has discovered the areas where the essenes lived they had very strict dietary laws very strict and when the bible tells us and, and this is why i find it very interesting to look at some of these small details it says that do you know on what john lived right like sister said john the baptist locus and I mean can you imagine catching a locust dipping it in honey and eating it crunch 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 But they had strict dietary laws and the New Testament is trying to give us a bit of a hint that John belonged to that community although he was the son of a priest probably from the Pharisaic line not the Sadducee line no he could have been because the priests were also some some were sadducees some were pharisees we don't know but definitely it seems very likely that he went and lived along with the essenes now the essenes believed that they were the people who were to prepare the way for the lord this was their teaching among their their top leader said listen the role of our community is to prepare the way for the messiah to come that's the background in which john comes and says listen i'm the guy not my entire community i'm the one selected to prepare the way for the lord 
you see there's a background i'm trying to say i'm trying to build up that background to each of these statements in the new testament so that we understand the large complex environment in which all of this was operating now these were scholars the essenes were all scholars because they were people who were studying the word of god they didn't waste time in in too much of discussion and too much of talking with the government and talking with these people that people they said we'll invest our time in studying the word of god and they said let us start to prepare copies because you know at that time there was no printing press everyone had to write the scriptures each one had to be written there was a way in which everything could be written there was a particular format in which it was to be done and these people spent years and years to prepare scrolls copies of the word of god in the year 1947 a discovery was made in these qumran caves which is called as the dead sea scrolls have you heard about the dead sea scrolls okay the dead sea scrolls were written by this community today they are considered the most authentic biblical manuscripts that are available today if somebody comes and asks you how do you know that your bible is true i mean what are we going to say zondovan printed it so i know it's true how authentic are your scriptures do you have scriptures actually from the time of the prophets or from the time of the lord jesus christ when we ask such questions we don't have answers and typically a lot of muslims will come and ask these questions to confuse us we go back and say we have the dead sea scrolls scrolls that were written even before the time of the lord jesus christ from 300 bc from that period of time we have the oldest scroll of isaiah which is kept in the museum in jerusalem we know our word of god was not written 1000 years back and there are multiple copies there are thousands and thousands of copies that have been made right from the book of genesis authentic copies one is one is compared with another 100 years apart and both have exactly the same manuscript we need to thank this community the essenes because they preserved the word of god we have it today because they preserved it at least the old testament scriptures amen so these were guys who had lot of a lot of problems with the pharisees and with the sadducees but they kept their integrity and what their calling was to preserve the word of god and make it available for the next generation okay now uh, we are told in fact by one tradition that it seems when the night before the passover uh, the the lord sends his disciples into jerusalem and he says you'll find a man that's walking and you go and tell him look the lord needs this room apparently this was the essen community this is what some scholars of the bible say i don't know i have read this somewhere i'm just uh, passing this on as a small tidbit of information but it seems that yeshua was very close to the essen community and operated a lot with them and agreed a lot with their way of life as well okay now we'll move on to the next group which is called the zealots okay now as this word says they were people who were full of zeal and again they consisted of people from both sides of the spectrum the pharisees the sadducees now among the things that they thought of and remember they were people of zeal so what were they zealous about they were zealous about the word of god the torah they were zealous about jewish life jewish tradition and more than anything else the land very zealous about the land so they were the people who said we need to overthrow the roman empire throw them out kick them out because this is our land our messiah is going to come and he's going to reestablish the kingdom of david here in the land of israel these were the zealots Yeshua had one disciple who the Bible tells us is a zealot you can open to Luke chapter 6 verse 15 which talks about three disciples in this verse if you want to you can open it and read it and it says the last part of it says Simon called the zealot does your bible say that no matter which version it says that okay this is the group now they were committed to overthrow the government 
and you know if you look at it from an indian environment okay because as indians we see it we had the gandhi side of thinking let's say let's say 80 100 years back and the other side you had the bhagat singh style of thinking you, you know the difference so the gandhi side of thinking was kind of like the pharisee way of thinking the bhagat singh way of thinking was like the zealot way of thinking might power strength authority fighting to throw out the occupying force and the gandhi or the pharisee way of thinking was okay sit dialogue peaceful right let's let's do it in a different way both indians once uh, one group will probably agree with this side one group will agree with this side we don't know whom sometimes you may agree partially with them sometimes you may agree partially with them it was a very mixed bag of a lot of things now the zealots are the ones who would say that have you heard the the scripture which says an eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth now we tend to think that every jew believes that if i knock out your tooth you're going to knock out my tooth but that is not true it is only the zealots and part of the sadducees who thought like that the pharisaic interpretation was completely different they said you need to give the value of the tooth or the value of the hand so let's say you break my hand okay let's say pastor nitin breaks my hand i hope he doesn't do that <laughs> but if he does and now for the next 6 months i'm not able to work the zealots would say hey you he broke your hand now you break his hand and for a hand a tooth for a tooth a life for a life the pharisees would say no no this is this is not adding value to anybody you have a broken hand you can't work you can't add to the economy you break his hand he can't work he can't add to the economy this is stupidity this is utterly nonsense this is not the way father god thinks so they said the way father god thinks is that he broke your hand you can't work for 6 months what's the value of your salary for 6 months he pays that to you a hand for a hand you find this interesting right because it's two groups two groups thinking in two totally different ways and the lord said listen you heard this but i'm telling you just turn the other cheek forget it <laughs> so i heard a, a, fa- a pastor i won't name him pastor ezra knows him very well in in pune talking once i was in a in a pastors meeting and and this senior pastor very elderly man he was talking he said you know when i was in bible college and he said i was in junnar bible college and there i i read the scripture that if somebody slaps you on your right cheek you turn the other cheek so he says that one day somebody comes to me and slap me on my left cheek so he said i punched him on his nose and i broke his nose i'm i'm sitting there as a young guy you know listening to a very senior man of god So he said you know the bible says if he slaps you on your right cheek you turn the other cheek he slapped me on the left cheek so i punched him in the face So you see that's how we interpret the word of god <laughs> the, the zealot said you fight back the pharisee said you discuss you put a financial you know you you decide what's the financial value of the damage that has been done so that's the the way both groups thought that's the way both groups thought differently and that is why you see some of the statements of the lord which talk about not getting into violence was addressed to this group not addressed to the entire house of israel addressed to this group in this context to them so that they would understand right so that's this set of groups okay now we'll move on to the next one now when you hear the word samaritan what do you think about sorry maritan on jews okay any one else yeah okay you think of the parable or you may be thinking about the woman in john chapter 4 at the well any any other thoughts okay so let's just put just one okay now uh, a lot of people would say this that they are the low caste of society as indians we probably understand right because we've seen the erstwhile caste system in our land some would say they're non israelis that's why yeshua said i am sent only to the house of israel to the jewish people and not to the 
Samaritans. He sent out the disciples also and said, don't go to them, only go to the Jewish people. Okay, now let's again understand who they were. So first of all, they were half Jew and half Gentile. They were people who married outside of the Jewish family as such. And when we look at 2 Kings chapter 17, you will find um, a bit of a, a hint in this direction because it talks about when the Babylonian Empire started to take away the northern ten tribes into captivity, some of them were left behind in Samaria, the region called Samaria, which is central Israel. In today's world, if you hear the news and they say the West Bank, have you heard that? West Bank? West Bank is nothing but the biblical Samaria. So I never use the term the West Bank because that's not a term of the Bible. The Bible terminology is Samaria. Yeshua said, go into all the world, go into Judea and Samaria and Jerusalem. So he used biblical language, which is what I would prefer to use. But when we look at the word West Bank, we understand this is what we're talking about. Now, the people who were taken away, the northern tribes, some of them were left behind and some of them were sent back as well. When you read the book of Ezra, not Pastor Ezra's book, the book from the Bible, Ezra, all right, which talks about uh, there were certain people who Ezra discovers were married to non-Jewish people. And eventually, of course, he tells them, listen, you better separate out because we cannot uh, do this to the seed of Israel <laughs> as such. Right, uh, So you, you get a hint that these were people who were now integrated into society. But at the time of Ezra, they were separated away. These were the Samaritans. They were not killed. They were provided for entirely. But they said, listen, we can't have you mix all together. Otherwise, the entire house of Israel is going to become completely mixed. We're not going to retain the pure, what they thought was the pure bloodline. So the Samaritans were the mixed people, but they were definitely part of the house of Israel because they did have some Jewish blood or some part of the inheritance from Abraham physically, that lineage that was coming down to them. Many say that they were part of the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh. Okay, uh, that, that's what many scholars say. I don't know if that is entirely true or not. Now, the Samaritans only believed in the first five books of the Bible the books of Moshe, Moses. They didn't accept Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Malachi, and all of these guys. So you realize that when you see the conversation in John chapter 4, you understand why Yeshua in, uh, engages that woman or the people of Samaria in that manner. He's only talking about the prophecies of Moshe, Moses. Because he, he realized that this is the environment in which they operate. This is the way they're thinking. So I need to bring the gospel to them. I need to bring the truth to them in the way that they understand it first. Yeah? Now, the, the Samaritans were uh, people who completely disagreed with the Sadducees and the Pharisees as well on many matters. One of the things that they disagreed with was they never accepted Jerusalem as the primary place of worship. They built up a place of worship in a place called Mount Gerizim, which you'll see in the, from the book of uh, in Deuteronomy and then in Joshua onwards as well. Okay, that's part of Samaria. Okay, so we won't go into much of those details, but this is the way they thought. And that is why when Yeshua talks to that woman at the well, he says, listen, we worship at Jerusalem, you worship on this mountain. This is the reason why. Because they never accepted that Jerusalem was the place where, that God had chosen. Today, the Samaritans, are, I'm, uh, I've read it somewhere, there are not even 1,000 Samaritans left. Okay, so slowly, slowly they've dwindled away or they have accepted the Jewish way of thinking or gone entirely into, into the rest of the world. Okay? Now, we've looked at the fifth group, right? Now, let's move on and look at the last group before we start to then look at the words of Yeshua. Now, the last group we're looking at is what is called the Galileans or the Nazarenes. People from belonging to Nazareth. Now, Nazarene and Nazarite is different. The Nazarite is the ones who would follow the law of the Nazarite, which you see in Numbers chapter 6. The Nazarenes are the ones who belonged to the town of Nazareth. That's why they said, Jesus the Nazarene 
or Jesus of Nazareth that as as he was called right because although he was born in Bethlehem he grew up in Nazareth and that is how a lot of the people were you will relate to it okay some of you have come from Tamil Nadu but live in Maharashtra so maybe your way of thinking or or lifestyle is today slightly different from people who have continued to live in Tamil Nadu is that right some changes are there so they would people over there would say hey you know you've diluted our lifestyle you've diluted our culture by going over there and becoming like the maharashtrians that's the way the judeans or the people from jerusalem looked upon these jews or these pharisees who had gone and were living in the galilee they said you know you've diluted everything that god has given to us you've become like the northerners that's not the way it's meant to be so they would have arguments and discussions on such matters the galileans or the nazarenes were people from there but who had migrated they were pharisees they were sadducees they were zealots they were essenes also who were there but the essenes finally moved down south but they were all a mixed uh, you know community that were over there now the jesus movement of the new testament started from here and if you recall at the time of his birth where did joseph and miriam joseph and mary go for his birth to judea judea was the state bethlehem was the city why did they go there to record the census the bible says that right to record the census why because that's where they belong to you're getting me they went back there to record their names in the census because they belonged to judea they were judeans living in the galilee they were tamilians living in maharashtra they were bengalis living in where punjab as an example no less indians but living in a different place no less jews or israeli but living in a different place that's how finally paul and his family finally go to syria right so he comes from there paul the jewish paul came from syria for the same reason because all of this kind of migration was happening at that point of time so the the jesus movement primarily started among the galileans and partially among the judeans the book of acts tells us that thousands of priests came to the knowledge of the lord and became followers of the lord jesus in the book of acts you see that you know 3000 were saved 5000 were saved at that time many priests came to the lord they were the pure judeans otherwise most of the disciples came from the galilee now when the gospel of john says he came to his own but his own received him not the traditional understanding is the house of israel rejected him the jewish people rejected him but when we look at it in this context that that his earthly parents went back to judea you see he came to his own to the judeans to the pharisees and the sadducees who control the temple to the ones who decide who is the messiah and they are the ones who rejected him it's very different as an understanding it's not the whole house of israel that rejected him it's the 70 leaders who decide this is the messiah and this is not the messiah the judeans rejected him and john is trying to convey that message to us he came to his own but his own received him not but many of those as many of those who received him he gave the right to be called the sons of god because he's talk, he's still talking within that context of the whole house of israel because the gospel had not yet got expanded to all of the world as yet you see i'm trying to tell you when we look at the scriptures we look at it in context we look at it in background and then we apply it in today's world we don't just take it out and apply it we look at the entire background and then we start to apply it okay so did we miss anything so the the galileans or the nazarenes were the guys who were the most open to the gospel all right so now we've looked at all of these groups let's move on we've looked at all of these groups the pharisees sadducees the zealots the essenes the galileans the samaritans and there were some others as well but all of them had one thing in common and what was that they believed in one god 
one God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. They all believed in that one God. Now, within that environment, the Lord understood different situations, different groups of people, and tailored his message, customized his message in order to address some of their wrong beliefs, some of their wrong practices, some of their wrong systems, some of their wrong ways of thinking, and tell them to tell them that, listen, this is the real way that you need to live your life according to the word of the Lord. Okay? So now with that, let's move on to how he addressed the whole thing. Okay? So... Uh, when we when we look at history after you have all of these groups at the end in 70 AD the temple of Jerusalem was destroyed perhaps you've read that in history or you're aware all right when the temple was destroyed you eventually have only two groups that are left the zealots vanished the Sadducees vanished because they were all killed unfortunately they were all killed by the Roman Empire the only two groups that escaped and were left were the Pharisees and the Galileans, who eventually, many of them, became what is called as Messianic Jews. Jews who believe that Jesus was, is the Messiah sent by the Lord. The Pharisees go on to rewrite the, the Jewish practices and modern Judaism follows the Pharisaic way of thinking. So if you look at modern Jews, Judaism today, it's different from the second century or the temple time Jerusalem or the Judaism of that time. The Judaism of Jesus' day was different from the Judaism today. Judaism of today is following the Pharisaic way of thinking. And the Messianic Jews are the ones who took out the gospel to all the world. And from there, eventually, what was called the Christian movement started to get born when non-Jewish people also started getting added into the family or the house of the Lord. Let's move on. Now, when, um, when the Lord was working with all of these different groups, he never focused too much on their beliefs. If you look at his teachings, they were very practical. And that's where now we need to pick this up upon. Because this is, this is now for you and me. He looked at what they believed. He understood what they believed. But he, being the son of God, he being the word of God, the word who became flesh, was trying to tell them that, looks, listen, it's not about what you believe. But it's about what you practice. And today the same thing applies to you and me. Today we often look at somebody who comes, somebody let's say who's preaching, or somebody we meet somewhere, or we talk about certain groups. Hey, what does that group believe? What is their doctrine? That's a lot of questions that comes into our minds. It's not about doctrine. It's not about what you believe. But it's about how you live. That is what the Lord was telling each one of these groups. And when we look at the post-Jesus era, you'll find the same thought process in the minds of the apostles. And that's what I want to look at next. The focus of James, the brother of Jesus. Right? You know that James, the book of James, right? You've read it. He's the brother of Yeshua, of Jesus. Now he says, I'm picking up a verse from James chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. He says, you believe there is one God? Great. You do a great job. But guess what? Even the demons believe that. So, so James is actually poking fun at them. He says, listen, what you believe is not the point. You can, believe, you can have a set of beliefs. You can make a full doctrinal statement. Great. Wonderful job. But guess what? Even the devil believes that. Even the devil believes that there is only one God. So it's not enough what you believe. And then James goes on to say, faith without works is dead. It's not what you believe in your mind. It's how you live your life. That's what James is telling us. That's what James is telling every one of the followers of the Lord. Okay, so now with that background, we're going to look at some of uh, how the Lord was addressing Pharisaic life. Okay, now did he have a problem with the way the Pharisees thought or what they believed not really not as such because when you look at Matthew chapter 23 verses 1 to 3 we we'll look at that verse Matthew 23 verses 1 to 3 the Lord says as he's speaking to the multitudes he says listen that the Pharisees they sit in the seat of Moses therefore 
whatever they tell you to do observe it listen to them they're okay their teachings okay but don't do as they do now this is where the rubber hits the road this is for us think of it in modern times the preacher's doctrine is good the group is great their statement of faith is fantastic but the lord is saying listen you can listen to everything they say but don't do as they do look at their lives we have a lot of great preachers on youtube a lot of things you can do you know throughout the week looking at this preacher that preacher but the lord is saying it's okay but don't practice with how they live because how they live is a problem and that may not be true for everybody but the focus i'm trying to say go behind the message behind the message what lies behind those words is the lord is saying lifestyle is most important when you look at a leader lifestyle is most important what does his or her or the entire family's life speak to you and similarly what about my lifestyle when the world looks at me is it about what i believe do i believe that the in the gift of tongues do i believe in this doctrine and that doctrine or is it my life which is fruitful what matters more james is saying that the lord is saying that over here as well that our lifestyle matters more than anything else you know the pharisees he went on to say the pharisees they love the seats of honor they love to be called in the front they love to sit on the stage they love to receive a garland they love to have the shawls put on them they love all of these things don't be like them the lord is saying listen don't 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 chase after these things and that's the lesson for us pharisees were great they had a great list of of beliefs great way they would go and they would pray they were very religious very good in all that they were not the bad guys the badness was that many of them were hypocrites they just couldn't live out what they preached they couldn't like you would say today they couldn't walk the talk a lot of people are disillusioned today because we are not able to walk the talk we have all the good things to say we have all the right lectures to give people but we are not able to live it ourselves and the lord's focus is not about belief not about what you think not about what you write down as the right way of life but the way in which we live our lives that's the most important thing people look at our lives people don't look at our fancy words when you're in college when you're in in a place of work when you're walking on the road people are looking at that i can put big jesus stickers on my car and break every signal and have the entire hindu world laugh at me and who are they laughing at finally at him and i'll justify it that you know i told pastor ezra i'm coming i have to be on time so i break signals it's okay i have not murdered anybody lifestyle if the integrity doesn't start from my life and show in the small things how can i be trusted with the big things and that's what jesus said right if you're faithful with the small things then i can give you bigger things if you're not even faithful with the small things forget about it even what you have will be taken away it's all about lifestyle move on bunny so this is the seed of moses okay just uh, just for you to understand in in every synagogue they would have what is called as a seat of moses the most prominent elder would come and sit on that seat and then what he would teach from there would be kind of you know considered uh, the direction of the lord and and the catholic church has picked up on that if you anyone from a catholic background anyone who's been an ex catholic anyone who's seen the way the pope operates he sits under what is called a canopy you've seen that if you've ever seen when he's addressing public if he sits under that canopy they've taken it exactly from you the seat of moses if you're under that canopy what you declare is a dictum that's come from god because they say he is the vicar of christ god's representative on the earth okay so i'm just saying they they picked it up from this mindset so jesus talks about it he says that look listen the pharisees they love to sit in the seat of moses so his problem was not with their teaching of course he said certain places he said you've added to the word of god 
you added listen you don't add to god's word all right now i want us to look at something very interesting from matthew chapter 5 and verse 20 now this is jesus's expectations from us from you and me and he says in 5 verse 20 for i say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the pharisees you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven ah that means the pharisees had righteousness as well i mean jesus is not saying that they were absolute donkeys they totally going to hell when he said woe to you listen he was sitting and eating with them <laughs> it's like you know you're sitting and eating in a family and say hey you're doing a wrong thing it doesn't it doesn't mean that you're not part of the family it's so within the family he's telling them something now he's telling us something more he's saying listen the pharisees have a level of righteousness but you my disciples need to exceed that righteousness and unless you exceed that righteousness you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven now we can take it as saying okay my righteousness comes from christ i've already exceeded the righteousness of the pharisees but remember james tells us it's not about what you believe it's about how you live the lord jesus said the same as well you can believe everything but you need to live it out paul tells us the same in the book of ephesians for we were created for good works he talks about the fruit of the spirit okay so we need to go a bit further from just saying listen just by receiving the lord i have everything yes i do but i need to live it out now my life needs to reflect that otherwise there's some gap between the two the lord is saying unless your righteousness exceeds that of the pharisees that means there was something good that the pharisees did and the lord is saying you need to do better than that so i want us to look at four things good that the pharisees did okay we've heard all our lives about how bad they were let's look at how good they were as well all right now number 1 the pharisees were evangelists would you believe that pharisees were evangelists yeah the lord tells us himself in matthew 23 verse 15 he says woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites not all of them some of them so he's telling the hypocrites woe to you not the entire group woe to you hypocrites for you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte one convert proselyte means convert you travel so much to evangelize to give out the word of god so you know if you look at it you analyze the statement they were sincere fellows they really they really believed what they uh they were con- there was conviction in what they believed and they wanted to take it out to people and the lord is saying listen you need to exceed that of the pharisees so if you and i think hey listen i'm i'm evangelizing people i'm giving out the word of god the lord is saying listen even the pharisees did that even they were good evangelists and you need to exceed that if you think you're doing a great job by sharing god's word even the pharisees did that you need to go one step higher So number 1 they were good evangelists number 2 they were great at giving tithes ah what do you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you give tithes of mint and anise and cumin but have neglected the weightier matters of law justice mercy and faith they gave tithes they were they were good church members no default first of the month salary comes in first payment goes to the church to the tithes they were great at that and the lord is saying not good enough my friend not good enough your righteousness needs to exceed that you're good at evangelizing fantastic thank you you're good at giving tithes thank you but i never needed your tithes the lord is saying i want your righteousness to exceed go one level higher that's the challenge to you and me today that's why i gave you all this background cuz we you me all of us i'm not lecturing you it starts with me it starts with my home we need to exceed that of the pharisees number 3 the pharisees did a lot of bible study john chapter 5 verse 39 he says you search the scriptures for eternal life and they speak about me so it means that he's addressing people who are searching the scriptures these were not people who were just living a casual life 
these were people who were meeting together for bible study they were talking about the word of god they were not just watching some greek entertainment somewhere watching some sports or some wrong things they were meeting for bible study and the lord is telling us i want you to exceed their righteousness you're good at evangelism wonderful you're paying tithes very good you're meeting for bible study fantastic but you need to go one step higher and then the fourth point that they were good at is they were good at showing a nice image to others all is well brother how are you today ah i'm blessed everything's good what's happening inside we don't know maybe there's that problem but all is good pastor all is well thank you i'm blessed by the lord so the pharisees were good at showing what was good on the outside but the lord said listen what matters is what's inside what's inside the heart is what matters what's going on inside your life is what i'm concerned about i'm not concerned about all the good statements that you make we may put up a great show in our meetings we may put up a great show when we go and meet others but the lord is concerned about what's going on inside and he says i want you my disciples i want you my children to exceed this this is the base evangelism bible study giving of tithes faithfully making positive confessions this is called positive confessions right i am i'm struggling inside but pastor all is well i'm prospering it is well with my soul because we think that in life in the power of the tongue i'll keep saying good things and good things will happen as an outcome pharisees that's all hypocrites dishonest you know one uh, somebody was talking to me and he was going through a lot of struggle in terms of uh, a relationship that they had with uh, uh, his family and the church family the pastor and some of the leaders and he said listen you know they have great expectations of me and my family and i have no problem with the expectations he told me he said because what they're saying is right it's as per the word of god he said but i'm not seeing it in their lives they have all the expectations of me and my family but when i look at them and their families they're not living it out that's the problem let the children come on to me for of such is the kingdom of heaven don't worry let them play sister tina no problem i'm not disturbed <laughs> it's their house it's the house of the lord okay so i'm saying that you know what, what, what is the problem the problem is that sometimes as pharisees we we live our lives performing duties taken the box kind of exercise and the lord is telling us that listen i don't i mean you need to do it it's it's good but your righteousness needs to exceed that and that comes by living the right lifestyle living out the word of god you know the pharisees had that i know it all attitude that's why yeshua said beware of the leaven of the pharisees i know it all i know everything there's nothing you can teach me the tradition is more important than the truth today a lot of unfortunately christian life is has become like that because i inherited a tradition that's more important than going to the truth of the word of god pharisaic way of thinking what did the essence say no we go back we look at only the word of god you see how do we learn from history and how do we apply it into our lives today we'll just end in the next few minutes but to exceed the righteousness of the pharisees our lives need to become more than just that routine our lives need to have that living faith that living relationship with the living messiah who's living inside us and walking with us that consciousness that i carry god's presence wherever i go i represent god wherever i go not just in the church not just in a prayer meeting not just when i'm at home but everywhere in every part of my life i can't have two faces one for the congregation and one for the world i need to have one face and one approach towards things my life needs to speak out my life needs to pour out my life needs to give out my life needs to be that that living offering that living sacrifice 
for the Lord. The Lord also said to the Pharisees, you've locked up the keys. People are not able to enter in because you've taken the keys of knowledge away from people. You know, sometimes we think we have all the answers. We don't. Paul says that we see in part and we prophesy in part. Unless we understand the larger diversity of the body of the Lord, without criticizing only what I think is right and everybody else is wrong, you know, we're becoming like the Pharisees. And the Lord says, I want you to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. Our, sometimes a desire for position, Pharisaic way of thinking. I'm trying to say all this. We all may struggle with these things today. These challenges may come up tomorrow. And the Lord is saying, I want you to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. I want you to really live out the word of God. There are responsibilities that God has given to us as God's children to live out his word, to live out his ways. And I'm trying to say that at the end of looking at all this, the Lord's focus was on one thing. Jesus' focus was on one thing. Live a practical life that reflects the word of God. Live a life that reflects what God has done inside your spirit. Yes, he saved us. By grace, we are saved. Not of our works, but our lives need to be saved. In the smallest of things, in the smallest of areas, when we are faithful to that, Shalom and thank you for watching this video. If you were blessed, then request you to please click on like and subscribe to our channel. We would love to hear from you. You may please contact us on the numbers that are mentioned on your screen below. And if you would like to listen to more of our videos and teachings, then you may please click over here, over here, over here and over here. Thank you, God bless you and Shalom.